Grab your pitchforks, heat up those fingertips because we're about to get a little spicy up in here. Over the last year, I've played 10 different miniature war games, and of all 10, I like Age of Sigmar the least. As of the recording of this video, I've played seven games of AOS 3.0 and another 15 to 20 of prior versions. Is Age of Sigmar a terrible game? Why do I keep playing it live on stream if I don't like it? Link in the description we play Thursday evenings. We'll answer this question and more over the course of this video. I'll start with my weakest point and then end on my strongest point, just like we learned in high school. Are you happy, Mrs. Jensen? I'm still writing argumentative papers, but instead of it being about my long cutting job, it's about miniature war games. In my head, it sounded more impressive to be writing about plastic toy soldiers, but now I'm not so sure. I'm making this video for those who are interested in Age of Sigmar as it'll give them an idea of how the game will feel for a somewhat beginner. As a reminder, this is just my opinion. Feel free to share your agreement or disagreement in the comment section below so people can get a wider perspective on the game. Writing a list for an army in this game is very confusing, especially as a beginner. As far as I can tell, there is no section in this book that explains how to construct an army list from start to finish. Apparently, that's supposed to be the purpose of a battle pack, like this shiny new General's Handbook for 2023. Assuming you've already picked your Grand Alliance and Faction, the first step would be to pick a sub-faction, if applicable, then a battle pack, and then how many points you want to play. Then your army must contain some number of battle line units, normally two to three, and a leader model who is your general. As far as actual model limitations go, that's it, but we're not done yet. After that, you need to pick a grand strategy, which is determined by your battle pack, and also a triumph, which is only used if your opponent has more points than you. After all is said and done, you have to consider fitting your units into war scroll battalions, which are formations that give your army buffs, and they used to cost points, but now don't cost points, and there are generic ones for everyone to use, and also faction-specific ones, and there's just... There's just so much going on and it's hard to track it all. And the only reason I was able to summarize it this well was because the app gives me little angry symbols when I'm not doing something correct. No, the same cannot be said of the online list building tool for Age of Sigmar. Why is this process not written down somewhere? Why is there no consistency between the web app and the phone app? Why is there just so much stuff in the list building process outside of what's actually in my friggin' list? Your guess is as good as mine. Before moving on to the next point, let's hear a brief word from this video's sponsor. A sponsor for this episode is Lazy Squire Games and their new 5th edition D&D supplement. Based on the franchise Legend Keepers, a roguelike video game developed by Goblins Studio, this supplement has players taking on the role of the monster in the dungeon as opposed to the hero. Stop marauding good guys from taking the loot that is rightfully yours. You can also play this campaign as a normal hero delve that's more your speed, but everyone knows that bad guys have way more fun. The Legend of Keeper's 5e Reverse Dungeon Campaign book is a 350 plus page tome containing four unique dungeons, 24 playable heroes, 50 plus playable monsters, and 12 notorious monster bosses. The crowdfunding campaign will also offer over 100 STL miniatures based on the heroes, campaigns, and traps from the campaign book. Sculpted by Lazy Squire Games, these miniatures will be delivered within one month of the campaign's conclusion in both supported and unsupported STL formats. Check out the all-in Game Master Pledge tier to get not only all 100 plus STLs for the campaign, but also a hardcover campaign book among a ton of other PDF assets. This campaign is also offering over 200 STLs from Stonecraft Dungeon, Lazy Squire's new line of 3D printable terrain. Players will also be able to use these models to craft expansive and highly detailed dungeons from the Legend of Keepers campaign or from their own fantasy adventures. You can find the campaign linked in the description below. Thank you to Lazy Squire Games for sponsoring this episode. I'd like to tell you why AOS is kind of bad. There's just so much stuff in this game. <laughs> Age of Sigmar replaced Warhammer Fantasy Battle because the game was very complicated and that caused the player base to dwindle. Where AOS started out in version one was absolutely a simplification, but that game was even more of a dumpster fire than this one. And so over time and each revision, the game became more and more complicated and included more and more stuff like war scroll battalions, grand strategies, battle tactics, endless spells, command points, and more. The simplicity of the core game remained largely, they just added more stuff around it. 
On top of that, the rules for this game are needlessly verbose. Having recently read through the whole rulebook front to back, it was exhausting how many times I had to reread sections, scratching my head as to why they felt the need to use 100 words to describe something when 20 could have done just fine. My favorite example of that is here. A unit with the wizard keyword on its war scroll is a wizard. Your game shouldn't have to live in a world where stating this is necessary. But Scott, if GW doesn't do this, people are gonna abuse the game. In my opinion, the core rules should be written for normal people, and the one percenters can deal with the added reading and some other document freely available online if they wanna be annoying pedants. However, that might make my next point even worse. Rules for this game are spread out everywhere, from the core rule book to significant rules in army book to the general's handbook, which changes the way the game is played once every six months, to white dwarf magazines? Why are my factions rules in a subscription magazine? Admittedly, I don't know how often this happens anymore. Thank God for Wahapedia, a lovely free website that summarizes everything I need to know about the game in one spot. Or else I might just not know about a faction rule that I have, like deadly coordination, because White Dwarf issue number 471 is making gameplay changes to my $55 battle tome. Have I not already paid enough to get the updates also? Also, yes, I know this battle tome isn't a Soul Blight copy. This is the only battle tome for AOS that I have because I don't really buy them. Luckily, they put the updated rules for their factions in the AOS app, but you still have to buy the book to have access to that info in the app. They used to allow customers to buy a $15 digital version of the Battle Tome, but that is no longer an option, and you have to buy the big, expensive hardcover book to get access to the digital one. GW, if you're trying to stop pirating, this is not the way. The giant elephant in the room that we're not discussing regarding all this bloat is that it's really expensive bloat. If you wanted to play this game with your friend, you need to have a core rule book, which is 70 bucks, or a general's handbook, which is 50 bucks and gets updated every six months, so I expect you have to keep rebuying that. Additionally, each of you needs a battle tome for your factions. These are $55 a piece. While most companies are moving toward freely available rules, GW is digging in their heels, and sadly, I think this idea is here to stay. Rule books and the like represent a revenue stream for a publicly traded company. They can't just give us rules for free without replacing that revenue with something else. They don't entirely have their customers' best interests in mind. It's partially controlled by someone else who cares more about the bottom line, the money. I'm not saying GW won't do it at some point in the future and that they're even doing anything inherently wrong. It's just a very obvious, frustrating boulder in the way of making this game truly accessible. When building out a hero in Age of Sigmar, you have several options to give them buffs items, command traits, spells, if they're a wizard, anything that's extra. For the most part, it kind of seems like all of these options are meh, save for a couple. A problem could be that none of them are costed at all, so they're all free. Imagine having to come up with six to eight items for each sub-faction in this game, of which there are countless, and have those items be compelling buffs, unique and interesting, and also the exact same power level. That is extremely hard to do. The solution seems to be to make 70% of them all really bad or similar to other ones, which makes for a really lame experience. Their predecessor to Age of Sigmar, Warmer Fantasy Battle, had similar categories for the buffs you could give to heroes, but they were all costed. You could give someone a 10-point thing that had a small buff or a 40-point thing that had a larger benefit. Expanding the design space of the game allowed for a richer experience in that regard, but it isn't always the answer. The same can be said for the various choices for units you have in armies. As a Soulbite player, I feel like a lot of my units aren't very usable, so it's a bit of an internal balance issue there, and apparently there are stats to back it up. This graphic is from a Metal Watch article by GW showing that in recent tournament games, the majority of Soulbite models are simply not being used. By the way, huge shout out to individuals like Rob the Honest Wargamer for maintaining rigorous stats for this game and presenting them beautifully. They went a long way in helping me understand AOS from a balance perspective, and my friends and I love to pour over them. You can find Rob's channel below if you're into the tournament-going AOS scene. The good news here is that because GW is tracking these stats, it's something they care about. I've heard that they've done a really good job on the last two army releases in this regard, but that still leaves many others languishing in the meantime, and it might be reasonable to expect this experience if you're picking this game up sometime now or in the next couple of years. Next couple of years? Why does it take so long to fix this problem? There are 26 factions in this game, so likely be a while before all of these are brought up to snuff. What makes matters worse is when the developers are, say, halfway through fixing the game, the game will largely go through some larger change that resets its requirement to have all these armies adequately updated. An example of this could be updating the entire rule set for Age of Sigmar. 
with the long development cycle GW maintains, it feels like the issue of not being able to update your factions fast enough to shore up differences between big gameplay changes you want to make is going to remain a constant forever. I fear that factions in this game will always be in some fragmented state of armies designed for the current version and armies that have band-aids applied. There's something else to consider here that GW is first and foremost a model-making company. They don't make money from creating compelling rule sets. You can definitely say that again. They make money from creating beautiful models, and they are absolutely great. But because of that, they create new factions and new units for existing factions ad nauseum, which feels like it's only gonna make the aforementioned problem worse and worse. I don't fault GW for doing this, it just seems to be where we're at right now. The goal of every single game boils down to holding objectives, achieving your battle tactics, which are goals you select each round, and accomplishing your grand strategy, which is an overarching goal for each game. Every single scenario, which W calls battle plans, reads almost identically. There are some number of objectives on the board to capture, and you get points based on how many you control. One or two battle plans add a bit more to this, but the core remains the same in all of them. Surely there are more interesting concepts that could be introduced to spice up the gameplay a little bit. Here's an idea for you, GW. You could write a battle plan book and charge 40 bucks for it. Wait. Okay, okay, but what about battle tactics? I friggin' love the idea of battle tactics, a shifting objective that you get to pick as the player based on the current game state, and you can't pick the same one twice, which encourages strategic movement. Unfortunately, the execution is lacking creativity. They all largely boil down to me killing stuff or claiming objectives, which are kind of the same thing. To capture objectives, you need to have more models on them than your opponent, basically. To do that, it's very reasonable that you would kill those models, thus achieving your battle tactic and also the goal of the battle plan in one fell swoop. It would be way more interesting if the battle tactics offered up different goals that didn't coincide with the ones already present in the battle plans. This way, it allows real room for strategic choices because you have alternatives if your opponent has a stronger board presence, say on turn two, and you need to retreat and recoup some points, but you can't compete with them on holding objectives this very moment. As a player in AOS, it's pretty easy to understand what your opponent is going to want to do on any given turn, so the decisions seem pretty straightforward. I'm gonna capture points by killing models because in doing so I achieve not only my battle tactic, but also the scenario objectives and also deny my opponent who wants to do the exact same thing. The goals are in plain sight because everything just points to them, either literally or either because one achieves the other. When it comes to grand strategies, those are a bit different, but largely easily achieved. The interesting scenario that this creates in the game is that if you're not scoring the max number of points every single round, which is five, you're falling dangerously behind because it's pretty easy to score all five points because of how everything pretty much just aligns. Related to actual gameplay, the actual fighting in this game feels very all or nothing. Generally, my friends and I are always setting up for our important units to completely destroy an important enemy unit or cripple it entirely. If that doesn't happen on my turn, it usually means that my unit is going to become completely destroyed or crippled this turn. I want Age Sigmar to have more of a back and forth experience instead of something that's so black and white. This creates a negative feedback loop for me and my friends when we try to do the big bad thing our units are supposed to do, and when it doesn't happen, it causes something of a feel bad moment. Speaking of those, it's the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about Age of Sigmar's relationship with dice rolling. War games include dice, which introduces a fun risk factor into the game. Some games lean into that, some games lean away from it, but you can never get away from it entirely. Whereas games like Guild Ball try to design dice out of the game, the rule writers for Age of Sigmar try as hard as possible to include as many dice rolls in this game as humanly possible. Casting a spell is largely always 2d6. A different angle on casting spells in war games could be 1d6 plus some magical stat for the unit. This way there's always randomness, but better wizards have an easier time because of that constant magical stat. Sometimes when you get a spell off, you have to roll again to see if the effect even happens. Some units have built-in abilities that only go off on dice rolls, like Riders of Ruin. Why not just give me the ability for free and increase the point total of the unit by a little bit? Roar, a monstrous rampage ability, has a very nice benefit, but only goes off on a three-up, making it feel bad when one player's dice rolls are hot and the others aren't. For me, these design choices create opportunities for more feel-bad moments. 
Either the opponent is frustrated that luck wasn't in their favor, or the player rolling the dice is frustrated by the cool thing that didn't happen, like when rolling a one when using the aforementioned Riders of Ruin, or when my Cities of Sigmar friend who has a lot of wizards just can't seem to roll high enough with 2e6 to get any spells off. Let's talk about the ultimate feel-bad mechanic in Age Sigmar, though, the double turn. In AOS, at the beginning of each round, both players make a priority roll to see who goes first. If you tie, it seesaws back to the player who most recently did not have a turn. If you're following along, this means that every single round there's an approximate 42% chance that one player will go two times in a row. That's significant because in Age of Sigmar, you get to use everything in your army on your turn. There's a lot to consider here, so let's go over that. Some phases of the game, like half of the hero phase and the combat phase, are basically alternating. So it's not like your opponent gets to hit you two times in a row with zero repercussions. However, the spell casting portion of the hero phase, the shooting phase, and the movement phase are not. There often are one or two moments in every game of AOS where it feels like if one player were to get the opportunity to go twice, it would be devastating. And when it happens, it often is devastating, and it just feels super bad as the player getting the benefit and the one on the receiving end. In some senses, it can feel like you're cheating. This isn't a me thing either, having watched several games on the Season of Wars YouTube channel, which features tournament playing AOS gamers. There are moments when they state, And we are into, uh, as always, a big priority. Still with Pryo, if it goes against me, it could be very bad. Yeah, it's gonna be a classic turn to Pryo, Let's but, go into um, it. We're going with the Du Bois dice. That's a three. I always roll fives, but... It that should be a three. It should be a three, but it's a cock. All Jordan's right. great at Pryo. Bridge wins Pryo. That's fun. <laughs> Let's go into Staven turn two. Here we go. Now, I'm not here to talk about whether or not rolling for priority is a good or bad mechanic. It's literally the worst part about Age of Sigmar. Hopefully, I'll get to do that on Vince's show, Warhammer Weekly. Personally, I hate moments like this in games. I want to win because I out-strategized my opponent in the list-building portion of the game and the execution. Not because I won some BS roll and got to blast them off the board two times in a row or got to move up somewhere unexpectedly and charge something that I could have otherwise never been able to reach had I not moved 20 inches plus a 2d6 charge over the course of two turns with my cavalry unit. Obviously, saying a double turn was the entire reason someone won is ridiculous, but how much of a contributing factor is it? 50%? 70%? Honestly, I want a very little part of my victory to be attributed to dice rolls or any kind of luck. So anything over a theoretical 15% is too much for me. Does this make Age of Sigmar a bad game though? I would argue that some of these elements do make AOS a bad game, like the aforementioned flat gameplay or how convoluted the list building process is, but excess dice rolls? That's just a matter of opinion. When I play a miniature war game, I'm looking for a tight rule set and a competitive experience. I'm not a tournament player, but I am what I call a so-so pro, a hybrid in-between wannabe competitive player who likes to spend his time with games that enrich the part of my brain that loves strategy and outwitting your opponent. There are a lot of dice rolls in Age of Sigmar, and it can often feel like it undermines the effort that I might put into winning a game, and that isn't my preference. So no, I don't think Age of Sigmar is a bad game, but it probably just isn't for me. But why do I play it? Age of Sigmar is the only game on the market that features large fantasy armies, and this is the kicker, has the highest percentage of absolutely excellent models in their range. Sure, I like these handful of models from Parabellum's Conquest, but there isn't an army's worth of figures I'm interested in. While I am a competitive player, I'm also a massive model collector and take a great feeling of pride in fielding an army that I am into aesthetically. Also, if I'm into the design of an army, I enjoy painting it that much more, which swells that sense of joy that I get from collecting a beautiful army, and that can't be understated. If I'm gonna invest my time in painting a large army for a game of this size, which takes a long time, it's gonna be one that I think looks beautiful and that I love. Not necessarily because the rules are written well. Hint, hint, Mantic and Parabellum, I don't think I'm alone in this opinion. 
That'll be it for this video, guys. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you wanna check out more videos like this, I'll have them linked at the end of this video. If you're interested in gaming, I have a gaming live stream and you can check out the link down in the description below. We're actually playing our 1250 point game of AOS in our Escalation League this Thursday at 7 p.m. CST. So come tell me about how my opinion is trash and I'll ban you. Just kidding. If you wanna check out some of the VODs or the games we play, I'll link them now in the video in the top right hand corner of the screen. And I'll also in the description below. Don't forget to check out this video's sponsor, Lazy Squire Games. And if you want to support the channel, there are many ways to do that, namely a Patreon campaign with a bunch of fun rewards, like a Discord server where you and I can hang out any day of the week and chat about your miniature painting projects or why you love Age of Sigmar. All the ways to support the channel are buying my model, the Duchess, and a digital course that goes along with that, teaching how to paint the model step by step. You can also buy hobby equipment that I recommend, my merch. All things linked down in the description below. Subscribe or die! And most importantly, don't forget to paint my minis! At the top of every single round, both players, ployers, they're ploying. How about that, Mrs. Jensen? I'm still writing argumentative papers, but instead of it being about my lawn chopping job, lawn chopping, that's what you call it. You call it lawn chopping. Penises, big old fat penises. What do I mean? <laughs> what I want the game to do is to define how much drain to use or what uh, And there are generic ones everyone can use and fascist, fascist specific ones. Whoops. For existing factions ad nauseum, which feels like it's only gonna make the exit. <laughs>